Well, good morning or good afternoon, depending on where you're joining us from today. Thank you all so much for taking time out of your day to help us kick off the National Slavery and Human Trafficking Prevention Month, which is all of January here in the United States. We wanted to begin by focusing on this incredibly important issue of cyber safety. Um, it's something that we have seen a rise in human trafficking happening in uh, virtual contexts, particularly through social media um, during the pandemic as more and more children and adults are spending time online and using social media. Um, so it's an incredibly relevant and important topic that we're bringing you today and appreciate you joining us. Before we get started, I would like us to just take a moment of silence and prayer as we are entering into this National Month of Awareness and Education about human trafficking. We remember that for us at U.S. Catholic Sisters Against Human Trafficking, what inspires us and encourages us in this work is our faith, our belief that uh, God also desires to see a world without trafficking and exploitation, and that God is accompanying us in this work that we're doing. So we just take a moment to remember that divine presence with us as we prepare to open our hearts and our minds to the information we will learn today. Thank you. On behalf of U.S. Catholic Sisters Against Human Trafficking, um, I want to also let you know that we have a number of resources developed to support you in all of your efforts this month and throughout the year. You can find those on our website at sistersagainsttrafficking.org. In particular, we have a toolkit full of resources um, for January and February that can be found under our prayer resources page. So I encourage you to check that out and share that with your local church or faith-based group or community in order to take action this month and weave that into your regular um, you know, liturgies and prayer services as well. I will now turn it over to our program director, Teresa Flores, uh, to introduce our um, topic for today. Good morning, everyone. Thanks so much for joining us. Um, we are really excited to have this program um, in the new year of 2022 um, because it is one of a part of our mission to keep kids safe um, and really educate parents and uh, um, grandparents and um, people out there on how to do this best. Um, so I would like to introduce one of our great board members for the U.S. Catholic Sisters Against Trafficking, uh, Bill Miller, and uh, he uh, is a part of Notre Dame. And he, he uh, is the one that actually referred us to Russ. So um, Bill is going to introduce Russ for us. Thank you, Teresa. Russ Tuttle is the founder and president of the Stop Trafficking Project. Russ's bio is extensive, and I don't want to take away from the short time we have with Russ today. So I will simply highlight two of his initiatives. The objective of the Stop Trafficking Project is to end sex trafficking of minors before trafficking starts by disrupting the exploitation of their vulnerability. Russ presents his Be Alert strategy to both students and adults. The Be Alert strategy is designed to educate and empower students to recognize and resist grooming and to move adults from awareness of the problem to action to protect our children. Let's engage with Russ now and learn about the trafficking of minors and what they and we can do to stop this crime. Russ? So first of all, let's let me say what an honor it is for me to have this opportunity. I'm truly humbled by this and I'm grateful to all of you for the excellent work. And I will be remiss if I do not give a shout out of greeting to Sister Jean Christensen, who I saw your message in chat. Um, I miss you terribly. Um, she semi-retired and left us in the Kansas City area where I'm based. 
And we had many wonderful opportunities to work together in the past several years on task forces in various situations. And now I trust she's doing well there in Nebraska. And um, thank you, Bill, for the introduction and Teresa for all the work you're doing and Jennifer. I am, I'm big fans of all of you and everything you're doing. And so this truly is my honor and uh, I trust that we will gain some insight together today. You're about to drink out of a fire hose because I'm just going to throw a bunch of stuff at us um, in about 40-ish minutes. And normally I do a 90 to two hour presentation that was condensed to one hour and now we're going to condense it even more. So let's just kind of get ready to just dive in. As Bill said very eloquently, we do have main strategies. The organization is called the Stop Trafficking Project. That's our 501c3. The strategy that we utilize that we give away to anybody in any community is what we call the Be Alert strategy. It means we want to come in and we want, we want adults and students to be active, learning, empowered, relentless together. It's an acronym of Be Alert. And um, so what we do is we do training from, from law enforcement to um, sexual assault nurse examiners, to legislators, to faith community, to general presentations. But our sweet spot is going right directly into schools and talking to students. So that's a 40,000 foot elevation, what we do. We've, we've, we've been, I've been in front of about 160,000 people now of around 60,000 of those are students in the last several years with this strategy. And we're really grateful for the favor that we've been given to actually make an impact to end it before it starts. That's really the perspective I wanna bring for you today. That's our lane. Um, highly value all the wonderful, amazing organizations that we partner with who are active in restoring broken lives, assisting them from uh, escaping um, the life and um, our lane is we want to end it before it even gets there. So that's the perspective I want to bring for you. So with that end, I want to provide for you an image that I want you to kind of have locked into your brain throughout the presentation today. And it is this image right here. Um, let's get this computer working. So I don't know if anything strikes you as odd about this, but if this was your friend and you came to their door and you knocked on the door and they greeted you like this, you're going to be like, what is wrong with you? Half your door is glass. It's me, Russ. I'm your friend. All you've got to do is look through this big wide door and you say, oh, I wonder who's at the door. Oh, hey, look, it's Russ. He looks really small and kind of oblong shape and really weird. Okay, so this is the image I want you to lock into your brain. Because all of us have somewhat of a limited perspective of this issue of the role that online lives of kids play in their potential exploitation. So my goal today as this farm door shows is that I want us to have a big window perspective and have a clear understanding. So with that, let me give you some clarity. We're going to start by talking about some socially acceptable addictions. The gaming industry has created a tragedy amongst our kids right now today, and I'm not against gaming. But kids, kids today, um, their anxiety levels are higher than they've ever been, and their empathy levels are lower than they've ever been. And the gaming industry has created such a dramatic fantasy world um, that is playing into the exploitation of vulnerability with kids. So we all have kind of a love-hate relationship with technology. My hate relationship with technology started around 11.30 this morning when I was trying to log in to this presentation, and the little wheel just sat there spinning and spinning and spinning, and I was essentially freaking out, going, how am I going to get logged in? And honestly, I got logged in like three minutes before the rest of you logged in. So that's the downside of technology. The great side is, is we're able to communicate right now all over the world where you may be watching this from. Within technology, though, I do want to say this. In our lane, to end it before it starts, as abolitionists combating domestic minor sex trafficking, if we do not have a realistic understanding of the role that pornography plays, then honestly, I'm going to say a pretty harsh word. If we don't attack pornography, then we really have no right combating sex trafficking. So let me give you some insight into Pornhub. It's the 14th largest porn site on the planet, free 92, 2019 at 42 billion visitors. Now look at it here in the United States, we were number one. We outrate every other country on the planet. And also again in 2021, we still outrate porn usage per capita of any other country on the planet. That's tragic. The searches that define pornography in 2019, the number one category is amateur. That was really important distinction to make because pre-COVID, we had more and more young adults and students and even kids in elementary school using these amazing devices right here, these amazing cell phones to take selfies. 
And what began to happen was a lot of those images began showing up in pornographic type elements. Um, number four on this list is someone called Belle Delphine. You may or may not be familiar with Belle Delphine. I'm going to unpack some of her reality a little bit later in the presentation today. Now we jump to 2021. I want you to notice how it's changed. The searches that define 2019 to 2021. Pornhub, by the way, did not produce any data for 2020 because they were in a lot of trouble. Most of you on this call are probably somewhat educated about Pornhub and realize the problems that they went through. Um, they had about 2.2 million people signed the Exodus Cry um, um, uh, uh, efforts to shut them down. The Canadian Parliament has pulled them in. They're in a bunch of trouble. But I think they're kind of feeling okay now um, because now they are publishing their data once again. Now here's here's the challenge, and and as as you, I, I wish I had time to really unpack this for you, but changes have obviously happened. The number one search item is hente. I need you to understand this. Um, I just mentioned that kids are into the gaming industry this fantasy world, hente pornography is absolute despicable, cartoonish images um, where typically young girls are being raped by everything from demons to plants, to all kinds of horrific things. With that, right under that, the very second one is romance. So we go from this ultra gravity defying hente to romance. And there's a confusion happening within society based on a lot of COVID related things of how people are interacting with each other. And um, as you go through the rest of that list, I honestly, I wish I had time to unpack all this. As you read through that, one of the things I want you to understand is that as we go from this graphic, disgusting, despicable hente related to then romance and group and fitness which are elements that begin to be more important again. You know, as someone said, if it exists, there's porn for it. I want you to think that through. And this, this, is, this is kind of what's happening online. Um, it's not just a guy problem. So by Pornhub's own analytics um, in 2019, if you look down on the list, um, the United States, about 30% of porn users were female. Um, jumped to 2021, um, and now we see that the United States has bumped up 3%. So 33%. I see this with students in schools. When we go into our school assemblies, we do school assemblies for kindergarten through 12th grade age appropriate, different levels of presentation. I am finding younger and younger girls engaging with pornography at younger and younger ages. One of the draws are these graphic novels, online comic books, if you will. And I was uh, recently doing a presentation in a, in a public school and a girl who was 12 years old showed me at the end of the presentation, the kind of um, graphic novel she was reading and the primary love interest in this particular comic she was reading, the primary love interest, his name was Hades. And of course, it led into pornographic material. Here's what we're discovering all the time. Back in 2019, 80% um, of all porn is viewed on a cell phone. Now we've jumped from 2021. Now 83% of all porn is viewed on these devices. Now here's the challenge. Um, here's what's happening. Um, we get this all the time from adults. I've got to, we're going to the farm door. I've got to get a kid a cell phone at younger and younger ages to do what? to keep them safe, the big farm door perspective. Now, listen, I understand your kid may need a cell phone to go in from the bus from soccer to um, volleyball or just band or whatever at the end of the day and parents want to know where their kids are. I understand that what I want to do desperately in our lane to end it before it starts is help adults understand that the, the problem that these cell phones are creating with our students and we can't just say it's a phase they're going through, they'll get over it. The big window perspective is 83% of all porn now is viewed through a cell phone. So what all these have in common, they are all potentially addictive because of the dopamine release in the brain. So here's what I want you to do. If, 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 if in our short time together today, in the lane to end it before it starts by disrupting the exploitation of vulnerability, what I, while I need you to do as adults is go, there's more than meets the eye in all these situations. I've got to open my, my mind. What's the big window perspective on the role that the online life plays and the students I care about, and then boil it down to these three words. It is always about the exploitation of vulnerability. Every single form of human trafficking, 
is about a vulnerability that's being exploited, particularly with our kids who are being vulnerable online. So, so the starting place for you is think about who are the kids that I care about within my parish, my church, my soccer team, my school, my neighbor, my family, whatever it is, identify the vulnerability in those kids and then realize what can I do now to keep that vulnerability from leading to the next vulnerability that leads to the next vulnerability that can lead to the next vulnerability that can then potentially lead to some form of exploitation, especially when it's happening online. This is where a big part of the answer lies to help us keep our students safer. So by definition, what we're really combating is domestic minor sex trafficking. I'm not going to bore you by reading what the definition is. But what I want you to understand is this, is there can be no consent. And we're not talking about child prostitution. Um, we don't even use that word. Our kids are being raped for profit. And pornography is the engine that's driving all of this. I just want to be really clear on that. So let's keep those three words in mind. I want you to lock in on the farm door. There's more than meets the eye. What's the big one of perspective? It's always about the exploitation of vulnerability. Within that, there's always three risk factors. There's the societal and the environmental and the individual risk factor. What this means is in our, in my lane, it doesn't matter if I'm in an inner core of a large city. It doesn't matter if I'm in a rural community and it doesn't matter if I'm in a suburb. The risk factors look different, but when you bring in the online factor, it's all the same. So I get this a lot from the inner core, especially from adults. Not my kid because we're too street smart. <clears throat> wrong, big door, big window. I go to the suburbs, not my kid. We've got power and influence and we're fine out here. Eh, wrong, big window perspective. I go, I listen, I go ultra rule. A big part of our work is in the state of Kansas and Missouri. There's a lot of rural communities I go into and the mentality there is, hey, we don't even lock our doors. In fact, the black lab will be in the back of the pickup truck in nine hours when I come back from work. Their kids carry that mentality online. So what I want us to understand is the role that online life plays. So I'm based in Kansas City. So let's give you some really quick examples. Back in 2000, I want you to think through what technology was like in 2009, how far we've come. But clear back in 2009, um, law enforcement with the feds um, ran some decoy ads online. There were no kids being harmed. Um, so in 2009, they made it very clear they were selling young girls for sex. They had 500 phone calls in the first 24 hours. Um, here in Kansas City area, Children's Mercy Hospital is now ranked in the top 5% of the entire country for sexual assault victims. And we're supposed to be kind of in really conservative kind of Bible Belt America. Um, so on average, the sexual assault nurses see one to two acute cases happening every single day. So in 2013, Arizona State University conducted a study in 15 cities across America. Again, there were no kids being harmed, no adults being harmed. They ran decoy ads. And here's what they found in Kansas City, Missouri. 14.5% of the male population over the age of 18 was not online viewing pornography. They were looking to purchase illegal sex primarily for minors. That number represents almost 107,000 men just in this community. Drop that rock and the ripple effects of doesn't matter what community you're living in, this is a demand-driven business and demand is high. So where are our kids most vulnerable when they're online? Let me give you just really, really quick some stories from kids that kids tell me. This is in no means trying to identify every app you need to be aware of. But I was in a private Catholic school not that long ago. And at the end of the presentation, 11 girls in 11th and 12th grade walked up to me at the end of the presentation and a little bit of pushback on what I'd been talking about. And they actually said this to me. They said, we actually feel empowered taking our clothes off, sending naked pictures to adult men through Snapchat and Instagram. They told me that in a private Catholic school. Within about 15 minutes, nine of those 11 girls as I began to ask them questions, I said, started with, well, why don't you tell me how empowered you feel? Let's talk about this. Nine of the 11 are openly weeping. They're talking about all the body shaming they're going through online. They're rolling up their sleeves, showing me the cut marks on their arms where they're now engaging in self-harm. This is one of the tragedies I've seen among students. The levels of self-harm are skyrocketing because of the numbers of pictures of them that are online being used against them. So welcome to Snapchat. And this is kind of the introductory app. Um, a few weeks ago, the last school assembly, in fact, I did for 2021 before Christmas break and Christmas vacation was in a very small rural school in Missouri, where we found a fifth grader at the end of the assembly came up and began to disclose that she's using the Omegle app, which is a video chat app, and she's actually communicating with adult men through this Omegle app taking her clothes off, sending naked pictures, and these men are trying to meet with her in person. So thankful. What an honor 
tremendous favor for us to have been able to be there in that moment to help this girl. By the way, a sixth grade girl in that exact same school in rural Missouri was engaging in online sex acts during school hours on her school issued computer. Adult men were intending to meet these fifth grade and sixth grade girls. Kick Messenger, my personal experience with Kick Messenger happened in the cyber crimes training. Um, I was assigned to become online a 12 year old girl. I was given the name Jamie Jones 123 gmail.com. There was no geographical location where I live and no picture. And within less than a minute, I was sexually propositioned with pictures sent of adult male body parts. Tinder, this is an adult dating app. Actually, it's a hookup app now. Can you imagine how I felt when I had a young girl in second grade come to me at the end of an assembly showing me her Tinder account? And there were 17 adult men who knew and, and readily recognized she was in second grade, yet were attempting to get her to take her clothes off, send naked pictures, and hopefully meet them in person. Down is an app connected to Facebook. What's happening is there's a normalcy within a lot of these apps creating this hookup culture, this sexual culture with our kids. Scout is a flirting app designed specifically to meet new people and Meet Me uses GPS to help you find people who live nearby. I just want you to pause for a minute and think all these apps through that I'm throwing at you like a fire hose through three words. The exploitation of vulnerability. What is the vulnerability about the kid I care about? And they're using these apps I better get away from that peephole on the farm door and have big window perspective. So Blender is the app that popularized where people online say, look at a picture and say, you're hot, you're not hot. And 3Ender is an app of young, of, of couples looking for a young third. And of course, Grindr is very popular within the LGBTQ plus community. Most of the boys who are on gaming systems, who get connected with adult men. Um, typically, those men want them to get away from the game they're playing, whether it's Minecraft, Fort, Fortnite, whatever it may be. They want them to get onto the grinder app so they can have conversations with them. So just a few weeks ago, we were working frantically because a 10-year-old boy in a community in Missouri met this amazing guy online. They were going to be friends. And the 10-year-old boy ran away from home, was gone 18 hours, was literally hiding in a ditch from all the adults who cared about him because he was determined he was going to meet this new friend he met online. Um, thankfully, the caring adults found him before the predator did. Um, chat Roulette is another video chat site. I've actually had a, a students... Um, in the community where I live, adults contacted me saying their young teenage daughter had connected with someone in London via chat roulette, and she bought a one-way airline ticket to go connect with him. The Monkey app. And by the way, um, all these, we have, we have these listed on our website. So I know, I know this is overwhelming. I'm throwing so much at you. You're probably trying to take notes. Just don't. Just soak it in. Listen. Um, all these, we got about 100 plus items on our website that you can process and read through along with an app. Um, that you can download. The monkey app allows people to have kind of fun introductory calls. And so that's what this young 13 year old girl did. And here's what here's the mindset I want you to get back. Okay, so let's go back to the farm door where we started. Okay. And here's what kids are doing. This girl's 13 years old. And here's her mentality. I know what I'm doing. I'm 13. Mm. Big window perspective. Got a young adult male who is rating people online. This is just on YouTube. She sends him a 59 second video. She thinks she knows what she's doing, but the big window is that video ended up with 358,830 views and the level of sexual exploitation and pressure and body shaming and cyberbullying she began to go through was nearly devastating to her. We have to talk about TikTok. In my opinion, it's the most dangerous app that exists. Not only are people encouraging students to destroy bathroom facilities and schools and slap a teacher month and all these things, it is filled with pornography. Um, it is filled with vulgarity. And I'm talking to kids in schools who say they use TikTok to learn how to die by suicide. They use TikTok to learn about eating disorders. They use TikTok to learn some of the latest techniques of self-harm. She let that sink in. Jesse is seven years old. Mom and dad are home. She has no electronics of her own. Mom agreed to let her play on her phone for 15 minutes. Actually set a timer. Jesse's on the right-hand side. She gets on there, creates a social media account at 1.54 p.m. She doesn't know it. She knows what she's doing. She's seven. She's actually communicating with adult male who's pretending to be nine. Over here on the right-hand side, 
Jesse says, hi. He says, how are you? Good. How are you? I'm fine. Good. How old are you? Seven. How old are you? Nine. Cool. Send me your photos, he says. Okay. Jesse uses her mom's phone and sends a headshot. He says, looking nice. Send me your pics without t-shirt. She takes another headshot. He likes it, says, make some pictures without t-shirt. I like to see your body without t-shirt. You can almost hear the innocence in this little seven-year-old girl as she types this. I can't. His response, very much like a predator or a pervert or a pimp online. You can make some new pics in the bathroom without clothes. My mom said, I can't. Don't tell to anyone. Okay, it's secret between us only. Now, you notice the timestamp here is gone, right? And what has happened is her dad came in the room. And so timestamp, let's just jump ahead because we're running out of time already. And he says this, I'm her father and I'm a police officer. We've documented your IP address location. I recommend you refrain from the conduct. Her dad's a police officer, mom and dad are home. And this is the trouble she got it. Not a family anywhere should say, not my kid. Not when we're online, even if we're home. So here's the bottom line. If it has a messaging feature, kids can be groomed and exploited. In fact, during COVID, we, National Center of Missing Exploited Children has seen a 97.5% increase in online enticement of kids. So when sixth grade kids were asked about what parents and adults don't know about their online life, <clears throat> the primary thing I want you to realize is they talked about their secret accounts. They talk about their fake accounts. They talk about their fake rant accounts. So the good kids have their accounts and then they have their fake accounts. And what we need to pay attention to is the reality that there are perverts, predators, and pimps preying on our kids online. And our kids are going, I know what I'm doing. I'm whatever age. And the adults a lot of times are going, it's just a phase. They've got a cell phone and I put bark on the phone. They're safe. Okay. There's so much more we have to unpack beyond that, the big one of perspective. So very quickly, this is not passing judgment. This is a reality check. You need to know there are people out there preying on kids. You have everything from the very violent guerrilla traffickers. We have the compassionate mom. We have the parents who are selling their own kids. We have younger kids, 17, 18, 19 years old, selling younger kids. And you've got the Romeo pimp, like this guy, 32 years old, the bedroom sleepy eyes, to the point that where Mark's nickname was Mr. Lalo with those sleepy bedroom eyes. And of course, the tattooing of kids, because it's like branding cattle. I own you. So he tattooed his girls with the name Lalo. Why? Now, this is not my home. This is Mark's home. These are not my vehicles. This is not my cash and weapons. These are not my clothes. Very, very lucrative business. Remember, because demand is high. And so here's the reality. So, so we get really angry at people selling kids, as we should. But if it's a demand-driven business, then maybe we should address the issues of demand. Our lane is to end it before it starts. So we took a very short period of time. And, and what you see on the screen here are just names of individuals um, who are buying kids. And so I'm going to go through these really quickly. Again, not passing judgment because most of you would think these people walk among us. We maybe wouldn't necessarily think that these are the people that we think. So you've got a middle school teacher and a young police officer, the president of a university. This, this guy was negotiating sex with a six-month-old. These three grandfathers, their fetish was to buy kids the exact same age as their grandkids. Always a big fan of law enforcement. Love it when they do sting operations where there are no kids being harmed, but it draws out the demand. You see, sex trafficking kids is a high demand business. So what are we going to do for our kids? Here's the reality with our kids. Um, they all have desires and dissatisfactions in their life. And the problem is when they feel like no one understands me, I'm 14, nobody understands me, especially the adults. They just don't get it. Guess what they're doing? They're going online to all those apps and so many other places that we talked about. So here's what you need to understand about kids. It's the big window perspective. Not the, not, the, not the farm door people, the big window, and three words. It's about the exploitation of vulnerability, and here are the vulnerabilities you need to pay attention to. Yes, our kids in foster care are highly vulnerable. Yes, kids who are struggling with their sexual identity, highly vulnerable. Yes, kids who've suffered incest and drug and alcohol abuse as young children. Yes, all those things ramp up vulnerability, poverty, all those things. But let me pack, unpack it for every kid. This is currently the loneliest generation we've ever seen and yet it is the most connected online. What we're seeing is this is one of the most isolated generations, not just because of COVID, but so many other factors we have to pay attention to. And so we're seeing the level of depression amongst our kids skyrocketing. So all these things become vulnerabilities. And what we're seeing is the suicide rate and attempts of suicide and talking about suicide skyrocketing. I got done with a 
presentation for seventh and eighth graders. And a young girl walk up to me at the end of the presentation. So Mr. Tuttle, do you like my sweatshirt? It was a hoodie. I said, I like your sweatshirt a lot with no expression on her face. She said this, she said, well, my best friend just gave it to me, but she's dead. She died last week by suicide. We buried her on Saturday. This is the following Tuesday morning in the school assembly. On Monday, a package arrived in the mail to my new friend from the girl who has died. In the package is the sweatshirt my new friend is now wearing and a letter. And the letter starts out with, you've always been my best friend. I want you to never forget me. I know you always wanted the sweatshirt, so I wanted to buy it for you as a gift. I want you to never forget me. And then she began to unpack, and she said that she said, I'm going to die by suicide. Here's how, and here's why. And this girl began to unpack how she'd met this amazing guy online, and he told her everything she ever wanted to hear. And he convinced her to take her clothes off and send those hot pics because he couldn't stand it. She was so amazing. And she fell for all of her tricks. Says, I know what I'm doing. I'm in seventh grade. Big window perspective. She had an adult male predator. He met her in person after she agreed to meet. He violently sexually assaulted her. He took pictures. He took videos. He began selling her online. He took over all of her social media life. Began to cyber bully her online. This girl got into a controlling relationship that in seventh grade, she had absolutely no way to process. My new friend is standing in front of me, hugging the arms of her sweatshirt like she's trying to be close to her friend who has died. And the tears are pouring down her face. And she's got the, she's got the strings of her hoodie kind of in the corners of her mouth. And she's kind of gnawing on them like kids do. And tears pouring down her face. And it came to the point where she couldn't read anymore. She handed me the letter. Please forgive me, but I've given your name to the people online as another girl who's probably willing to take her clothes off and send naked pictures too. And I saw in that moment, this girl's entire being changed from fear to absolute terror. What an honor to be there in the moment for this girl. See, it's all about the exploitation of illness. How I wish desperately that some caring adult had been in there and for the life of the seventh grade girl who died by suicide. Because what we found out later is this guy was actually selling her online. She was a victim of domestic minor sex trafficking. But what an amazing opportunity to end the vulnerability in a girl who's standing in front of me now to keep it from going any further. We want to end it before it starts. I want you to know what happens to guys too. I had a young guy in a rural Kansas community tell me that he, when he was in second grade, he accidentally stumbled onto pornography and became a strong addiction in his life to the point to where when he was 15 years old, um, he got a picture of an, a naked adult female who said, I showed you mine, show me yours. And this is what he said. He said, Mr. Tull, I didn't even think. You know why? Um, because our kids, um, as I lovingly teach them in our school assemblies, um, are just half brains. And that's not a put down. I'm not making fun of them. We unpack that in a way to help them understand the frontal vortex of their brains are not fully developed until they're around 25 years old. And we unpack that in a way that it relates to students, but it helps them understand that you are not equipped to deal with some of these things you're dealing with online. So he took the pictures and he sent them. They met twice. In teenage vernacular, they hooked up twice. The third time, she said, I want you to meet me at a house. And this young man, now 16, it had happened a year prior. He said, I went to this house expecting to meet my new adult female friend who's 21 years old. He's 15. He said, Mr. Tuttle, she wasn't there. There was a house full of men waiting for me. I was the intended party. So in the world of domestic matter sex trafficking, there are people out there who will use their bodies. They will entice kids online, whatever it takes to entice them. And so we have to pay attention and realize it's this easy for our kids to fall into the traps that perverts, predators, and pimps set for them like this girl. Teen girl online is actually pretty easy. You can go into any chat room and just start talking. Most of the girls are usually so insecure and desperate for attention. attention from older guys is totally flattering. They're so much more mature and understanding than the guys my age. Age actually works to my advantage. They like to brag to their friends that they're dating an older guy, so I just play along and pretend I'm really interested in the same things I am. You can talk forever and really get to know someone without worrying about looks or whatever. That's the best thing about chatting. Chatting seems unthreatening to them, so they lower their guard. After a while, I start talking about how we're soulmates and how lucky we are to have found each other. Other people don't understand. I know what I'm doing. 
If you really care about each other, there's nothing wrong with them. Meeting them is the goal. Once I get them out of their house, well, that's when things get really interesting. So you can see the manipulation factor. What I want you to understand and why I flew by the beginning information I normally unpack a little bit more is that you're actually not arguing with your kids. You're arguing with a fantasy. And this is important now recognizing that levels of empathy have gone down amongst kids. Their anxiety has gone up and their online lives have increased and they're living in fantasy worlds. So let's go back to 2019 Pornhub. The number four most searched for personality was Belle Delphine. Let me unpack her story to give you insight on how this works. Um, her real name is Mary Bell Kirshner, um, 16, 2016. Um, she's a teenage girl who admittedly uh, was kind of depressed, didn't get along with people very good, and created this amazing online world on YouTube where she's posting all kinds of content and had two and a half million followers following her. The problem is, is to continue that, um, what kids are finding is to continue the level of um, online influence, they have to become more risque. And to get more attention, kids are getting more risque. So now here in 2019, you could pay her $3,000 for an online girlfriend experience. And now in July of 2019, um, she's now creating content. This is just YouTube. This is not even porn. Um, but this is two minutes of Belle Delphine being a thought, T-H-O-T. If you don't know what a thought is, it's that hoe over there. It's vernacular for a very young girl who's looked very innocent, daddy's girl, but will have sex with anybody, anytime. Um, and it's just kind of that girl. Then she decides she's going to create increasingly lewd content. And she's got people pay for it. So now she has patrons at the bottom of the screen down there. You see this. She said, I'm also really into kitten and DDLG play. If you don't know what DDLG play, DDLG stands for daddy dominates little girl. Also very popular is DDLB. So now she's continued to go even worse into this fantasy world. She's making tons of money. At some point, she says, if this photo gets 1 million likes, I'll actually make a Pornhub account. The time has actually come. This is heartbreaking to me as an adult male. Tag your friends slash dad. To help. You see, pornography is just like this socially acceptable thing in our culture. And Pornhub says, this is the best news I've heard all year. And so in 2019, Belle Delphine had almost 31 million searches compared to less than 19 million for Kim Kardashian. Enter COVID. She starts selling her bath water to gamer boys for $30 a bottle. She went increasingly into the porn world, showing up on Pornhub, all over porn sites. Now, now she's a 22-year-old adult female. Does she look 22 years old to you? You notice how she's using these apps to make herself look very childish. You know why that is? Because that's the appetite of demand. And the insight into that is this, this permeates into the sexual exploitation of children, including domestic minor sex trafficking. Tragically, this fantasy she created was one of her highest generating financially. 2021, Belle Delphine kind of disappeared off the scene. She went a while, all of her social media kind of disappeared and she quit using the porn sites and um, we've discovered why. Um, she now has an only fan site where she's reportedly making about $1 million per month. This is the fantasy world that's happening online. And guess what? Our students are innocently falling in all these traps on basic social media. And typically your kids aren't getting in trouble on social media by logging in and immediately connecting with a stranger. They're connecting with friends that then kind of trickles down to all kinds of other problems. The reality is this, the sexual exploitation of our kids, where the challenge is this, the farm door and three words, exploitation of vulnerability, that big farm door, is kids are so commonly sexting now, taking their clothes off, sending pictures, because that's how I prove I really love you. You prove you really love me. Sexting is the new flirting. So we help kids unpack the reality that not only is it illegal, um, but you never know the consequences who might see. And we do that in a lot of in a lot of creative ways with students. For you for purposes for adults today, I want you to know that in the last um, 18 months or so, um, we've identified these as kind of the top sexting or texting lingo. And the ones that are highlighted in red have become increasingly popularized during COVID and into the challenges of a lot of the isolation and schools being closed and then on again and off again, kind of depending on where you live. And so you see, you, you read all these and, and these are on our website as well. Um, so I, I'm not going to, I'm not going to waste your time too much with this, but I, I want you to, I want you to understand the KPC is keeping parents clueless. Right. Um, and in our world where it gets really concerning is down at the bottom of the screen. And this, this is the pattern. A, a, a kid online feels lonely, isolated, depressed, maybe 
considering is life worth living or not. Maybe they're being cyber bullied online. Maybe they're in a controlling relationship. They don't understand it. Maybe they're a boy in the gaming system, like the 10 year old boy who ran away and is gone for 18 hours. Maybe it's a girl in fifth grade or sixth grade engaging with the Omegle app, sending naked pictures to adult men because they're telling her everything she wants. And she's from a single mom home and things aren't going well. And eventually those perverts, predators, or pimps get down to these on the bottom. I, hate, I would like to meet in real life. And what's your real name? Now, before it gets there, you need to have an understanding of this. Um, this is from Bark, and um, big fan of Bark. We recommend it. Uh, but I just want you to kind of realize and understand some of the emojis that kids use and the, the highly sexualized nature of what the online life is creating in our kids. It's, it's a vulnerability that is so easily exploited when a kid feels lonely, isolated, depressed, and goes online and says that, and someone responds. Um, so this is why the bottom line for us is we want to make sure that we're teaching adults and students a rhythm of safety. We want to make sure students realize they shouldn't be communicating with strangers online. And we unpack that it doesn't start you online. All of a sudden there's a stranger, typically not how it works. We unpack why you shouldn't meet a, someone in person you met online. Um, we talk about the, the, the pictures that they shouldn't send. And what we do is we actually have, we actually have surveys that we give to students that they fill out in our student assemblies and it measures their level of vulnerabilities based on this bottom line right here. And in some schools, um, the, the generalized average right now, this is 40,000 foot elevation, about 60,000 surveys. And um, there's a report on our website. You can look up more details from, from last year um, that unpacks the levels of vulnerability with kid clear down to their pornography use. And this becomes valuable information to send back into the community because we're trying to get the community in that school to go away from this to go big window perspective and say, this is the vulnerability in your kids. And so then when the vulnerability leads to actual abuse, then we want to make sure adults know that the first thing they just need to do with that kid is, is don't be angry with them because they made mistakes online. Um, believe them, acknowledge, encourage them, stay calm. And, and whatever, whatever we do, I'm just going to say this because we don't have much time left, but um, just don't make promises promises to kids you can't keep. Be authentic with them, be real. And within the world that you work within, make sure you know what your uh, options are. We work really closely with law enforcement. And these are nine criteria that we use. You must report to law enforcement. This is not have a meeting. This is not what do we do? You are aware of any of these things on the screen. You have got to go to law enforcement. In the state of Missouri, I just want to kind of unpack the one kind of in the middle where the minor provided nudes to another minor who maliciously distribute them. What we're finding in the state of Missouri is about one third of the time when two, let's say two 14 year olds, we're in love, it's amazing. We're saying naked pictures to each other. And oh, by the way, you know, now this ongoing amazing relationship of two and a half weeks is over. Um, and now the big window is we're kind of mad at each other. And so now we're using these pictures against us. I've heard this story over and over. The problem is, is that now those stories are not staying between the 14 year olds because of the increase of online perverts, predators, and pimps. And so about one third of the time right now in the state of Missouri, according to the Missouri State Highway Patrol, when they're doing what they call backward investigations, let's say two 14 year olds are sharing naked pictures between each other because they love each other so much. There's adult level criminality involved. So don't play around with it. Most presentations of combating trafficking are going to focus on all these kind of indicators. Um, these are really important things to know and understand. Recognizing the tattoos, recognizing that she's with an older man she refers to as boyfriend or daddy, that older woman refers to as aunt or mentor. He's with an older guy he calls uncle, brother, cousin. He's with an older woman as refers to his girlfriend or aunt. All the different things that you probably are familiar with um, in presentations, these are all critically important. You got 13 year old with multiple STIs. Why is this happening? There's more here than meets the eye. What's the big picture? What's really happening here? that leads a girl to this position. It comes back to us in our lane to end it before it starts to recognize that pornography is the engine driving this. And if the National Center of Missing Exploited Children says one in five images is of a child of porn, that what's happening is we're seeing the sexualization of our kids. And so teens are viewed as a product to be sold. So therefore the high demand driven business and with technology, you, a key, you are never more than two clicks from porn. You're just not. And so for kids, 
they're bombarded by this constantly. And the, te- the, 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 the porn industry is actually targeting and baiting and trapping people. And what kids don't realize and understand is the addictive nature of the brain. And we unpack this in a very creative way to kids in school assemblies. And it is so often what boys and girls come up to me at the end talking about their porn addictions. I recently had a young boy in, in ninth grade came up to me. He said, he said, Mr. Tuttle, um, he said two days ago, I was, I was actually in my science class surfing pornography on my school issued MacBook. And then the very next period I was in my English class working on the same computer, working on a document typing. He said, but in my mind, I was having flashbacks on the screen of the porn I'd been surfing before. He said, he said, I'm scared. It feels like my mind is being rewired. What an honor to then be able to pass those students on to help that they need. And so I want to kind of open your perspective. So there, there, there's all these there's all these things that we kind of lock in. This is the only way that human trafficking works. This is the only way that sex trafficking of children works. This is the only way that domestic matter sex trafficking works. I want to open your mind to the farm door and the big window perspective. If you've got kids with any of these words on the screen, these are vulnerabilities that are being exploited online. And it becomes very subtle and becomes very dangerous. We never re-exploit the exploited in our, in our work. But we have a couple amazing people who want us to tell their stories. And this is Amy Nicole Robinson, born August 25th, 1994. And not only does she want her story told, she looked me in the eye, took me by the shoulder and said, you tell my story because I can't. I promise you at this age, she never thought she would grow up to be a victim of domestic minor sex trafficking. When she was 10, 11 years old, she was such a good softball player. She literally had college scouts watching her play. Um, She traveled on competitive teams through the state of Kansas and Missouri and Colorado and Florida. And she was amazing. But when she was 12, it's kind of the fitting picture, right? It's the, I know what I'm doing. I'm 12 and he's amazing. He's 14. He's online. He's telling me everything I ever wanted to know. The big one of perspective is he was actually a 21 year old adult male drug trafficker and pimp. He enticed her in all the ways that we've unpacked a little bit today. She felt lonely, isolated, depressed. And guess what? She had a mom and dad at home. Dad worked the kind of job where mom was a stay home mom. And she's a straight A student, active in the community and a top notch softball player. But she made a mistake online. The tragic story of Amy is she met a guy in person after sending him naked pictures and he couldn't stand it, had to meet her. And she thinks she's talking to a 14 year old boy the entire time. When they meet in person, she realizes a 21 year old adult male, he violently sexually assaulted her in the back row of his super cool Tahoe on rims. He recorded it. He took pictures and he began promoting Amy online and she was for sale quicker than you could blink your eye. She still lived at home, still went to the same school, same softball team, and she's a victim of domestic marriage sex trafficking. Lying, covering up, afraid, ashamed, scared. At the age of 14 and a half, she officially became a runaway of the state. They began taking Amy, and they ran a track of Des Moines to Dallas. I have permission to share all these pictures and her story. I do not have permission to tell you how or why it happened, but um, around her 16th birthday for three months, Amy got away from the people controlling her and she got to come back home. This is a picture of Amy's 16th birthday at home. Uh, Behind the beautiful smile, the beautiful eyes, you would never look at her in the natural and think she's a victim of domestic minor sex trafficking being moved every 36, 48, 72 hours between Dallas and Des Moines from the time she's 14 and a half before 16. And this is a message Amy has. One bad decision can change your life forever and evil comes nice. It's a message we've been using Amy's story, telling kids for a long time. Evil comes nice, especially online. And our kids are going, I know what I'm doing. And the big window perspective is we're opening up their world. Can I tell you how or why it happened? But what you don't realize behind those beautiful eyes and smile is the drug and alcohol addiction that was forced upon Amy when she was 13 years old. Only way they could control her. Two weeks after this picture was taken, she was 
back under the control of the people selling her. And as punishment for being gone for three months, she was sold to 37 men in one day of which she said 35 of them brought pornography and said, do that. Three weeks before Amy's 18th birthday, she was caught in a sting operation. Um, best thing that could have happened to her. She started doing really well. She was getting her life back together. We were assisting her. Other organizations were assisting her, working with her. Um, I'll never forget when she was 19, she told me she was going to get back on social media. I said, please don't. Within days, she was connected to people from her past. She got into a very toxic relationship. She had this little boy with him. And um, this little guy became everything to Amy, though. She was going to go to school. She was enrolled, working a job. Um, because what you don't know is she had seven forced abortions from the time she was 13 till she was 17 because demand didn't want pregnant product. Tragically, we had to bury her little boy when he was two years old. He drowned in a swimming pool when baby daddy was supposed to be watching him when Amy left and went to use the restroom. Didn't realize Amy was pregnant at during the funeral. And two weeks after this picture was taken, same baby daddy was supposed to be watching those little guy and he was suffocated face down and died on that exact spot on that couch. Amy was 12 when she made a huge mistake. And this is pictures of Amy on her 21st birthday, clinically dead for 45 minutes at KU Med in Kansas City. She wants this picture shown. Every picture I'm showing you, she wants this told. I'm sharing the story exactly the way Amy wants it told. And I hate telling her story. It's difficult. Trust it makes an impact. What happened? Um, the devastation of the life starting at the age of 12. Um, she was in the, month for hosp the hospital for months. She got out of the hospital. You know, around her waist. Um, essentially, it's a mechanical heart. She could never come unplugged from 10 pounds of batteries, 24-7, 365. Her heart failed. She did not qualify for a heart transplant because she was just drug addict and alcoholic. Previous in her life. So they gave her a, what's called an LVAD. Um, she had ups and downs throughout her life. And um, this is a picture of Amy and me on May 10th of this year in the hospital. You see, you realize that there is a fetish amongst people to purchase and abuse and harm females with a mechanical heart. And early in the year, her date left her in the middle of the street having beaten her with a crowbar. Um, Amy was dying here, but she was in one of the best places she could have possibly been. All the drugs and alcohol were out of her system. She'd been in the hospital that long and we had the best, most coherent talks. And she made me promise that I never quit telling her story. Amy died uh, this past Father's Day, Sunday morning. Um, this is the funeral service. And she's now buried between her two little boys. And um, Amy has a message for students and adults. One bad decision can ruin your life forever and evil comes nice. So it's all very dark, very depressing. Um, but in our lane, we provide hope. And we found a unique way to do that, especially with students. And so um, I had an experience where I was overseas drinking a cola product they called a thumbs up and i had a very disgusting thing happen where i ended up with a dead cockroach in my mouth so this is this is the story that we found a unique way to tell students because we don't go in and depress students we don't go tell students you're bad you're being horrible online we go and appeal to the hero and students we unpack for them the reality of the crime of human trafficking unpack how it can lead to domestic matter sex traffic and then we use this story um, so let me just tell you this. Um, a few weeks ago, I was standing in a Panda Express ordering my Chinese food and a student um, standing in the front of the line as I'm waiting for my um, sweet fire chicken that's not quite ready yet. I've paid. I'm standing on the other end of the restaurant and I see this kid waving at me frantically. I have no clue who this kid is. And long story short, he gets to the line. He goes, you're the cola cockroach guy, right? So I am known by students and adults alike as the cola cockroach guys. So, I mean, hey, if you got to be known for something, you may as well be known for that. The moral of the story is this. Here's the teachable moment. Um, we Here's what we tell kids to this. And this is kindergarten through 12th grade. Having unpacked everything I've thrown at you through a fire hose today, 
in our lane to end it before it starts, we want kids to realize this is the teachable moment. Listen, we all know we can have a little bit of cola, but too much is bad for you. You should mostly drink water. Sometimes there's a cola, cock, there's a cockroach in that cola, not all the time, but sometimes. And so we have to, we unpack for the little kids. What is that cockroach? Anything that makes them feel unsafe online. As we get through the older kids, we unpack what all those things are. I don't have time to unpack that for you today because we're almost out of time, but it's a teachable moment that lasts with kids. The two girls just a few weeks ago, fifth grade and sixth grade who were engaging with adult men, one through the Amigo app and the other um, online sex at school, they used the exact words I was using in the school assembly within 30 minutes as they start telling us their story and talking to school counselors saying, I need help. And so one of the things that we do is we get done with our school assemblies and we have kids yell, and I don't have time to unpack all this means. I think you intuitively you will pick this up as adults. They yell this, not in my life, everything we've been talking about. Remember, our lane is ended before it starts. Not in my life, not in my school, not in my future. They yell that, and then they yell, cola, cockroach, and they make crazy vomit sounds because we're trying to make it memorable, and it looks something like this. So this is a small rural community in Kansas. Seventh and eighth graders are actually three schools there combined to get that many students in there. That's that kind of a rural community. But a little girl came up to us at the end of the presentation, said there's a cockroach in my life. I need help. And the very next day, this guy was arrested and in jail on $1.3 million bond because one brave girl came forward. Soon three more came forward. Within eight months, we were up to 14 kids. Um, here's, we, we go to young kids as well. Um, I want to show you, uh, cause we're almost out of time. Young kids. So, so in our age appropriate assemblies, totally different content length of time, but we want to get the same message across because our goal is that, um, in the States of Kansas and Missouri right now, we're working on try to get our, uh, our, our presentation into students um, throughout their school career. I'm going to end on this one. This is a Catholic school. This is St. Uh, James Academy in Lenexa. Um, the first side of the gymnasium went, and this is the second side of the gymnasium, and these kids knocked it out of the park, and our goal is to have these kids have this level of fun and buying into what we're doing. So we'll leave it at that. My time is up. Um, you can connect with us on our website, stoptraffickingproject.com. We have all kinds of resources, all kinds of videos. There's an app that you can link to directly from our website that you can download for free. And um, thank you for everything you can do to help us end it before it starts. Thank you, Russ, so much. Oh my gosh, what amazing information there. Um, we uh, have recorded this um, and we'll be sending this out to everybody that um, was registered for this, um, this amazing webinar. We had over 100 people attend and I, um, I can speak, um, I think for majority of them that I got really, really choked up on Amy's story. Um, and it, um, I, you know, a, a lot of us do this work every day. Um, and sometimes we get tired as I'm sure you do too, Russ. And her story, um, sorry, her story just motivates you, doesn't it, to, to keep on going every single day um, because we have to stop this. It's, just, it's not a question and it's not an option anymore. So thank you for Russ for doing that. I really appreciate it. Um, we didn't have too many questions, really, just a lot of um, co uh, comments. Wonderful. Uh, Glenda is a CASA volunteer. I love CASA. Um, and so we need more uh, programs like this. So um, I know with COVID and stuff, it's hard to travel. Do you guys train people um, across the country to be able to do this presentation or how does that work? Yeah, so we have, we have a um, we have a relatively stringent um, thing we put people through to become certified presenters. Mm -hmm. um, because not so a typical it, it's not uncommon um, for us to go in and a presenter needs to speak to the adults first and so what we do the night before school assemblies is we pull together people in the community from law enforcement firefighters emts medical professionals counselors members of the faith community school leaders and then parents and guardians 
and we do a presentation for them. And then the next day we go in and we do presentations everything from kindergarten to 12th grade. So it takes some unique personalities to be able to honestly relate in person to all those different people at different age levels at the drop of a hat switching. Um, but when we find and connect with those individuals who are able to do that, um, absolutely. That's why I said at the start, the be alert strategy is something that we give away um, because we want people to be able to um, get this information out. Great. Yeah. Uh, when I do presentations I, at schools, I uh, require all of the participant, all of the people employed in the school, not just the kids to attend. And that's from everything from the teacher, the school nurse, the guidance counselor and the janitors as well. Yep. Uh, Cause they see that. So uh, my one question for you was um, you said like block it, save it, report it always. Um, I think a lot of us want to know like, who do we report it to? Mm -hmm. So that's going to be different. Cause I know you have some people in England and you have people kind of all over in California, yeah. that's, that's where you have to connect with your local abolitionists and kind of know where, where you're starting at. Um, for us, it's always um, for the first point of connection is with law enforcement um, now that's going to be different if you get, if you're in a school and the school has a school resource officer who has some training, they know what to do. If they don't, um, in some schools, um, we need to go directly to the feds because immediately I'm aware of, um, crossing state lines. Sometimes mm -hmm. in a school district, it may not be the local law enforcement, but, but maybe the local sheriff has a fantastic cyber crimes department and we've got to dig into this laptop or this phone. So it's going to be a little bit different all over, but, um, if your, your generic starting point is always, um, uh, report it to the national center of missing exploited children on their hot line um, you can call the hotline if you want but you, you need to call you need to call law enforcement so if it's just the basic 911 and you're in a community you have no other option what, what i say people you need to do is this is call them and say um, i'm calling and i need to speak with someone who has a little, some understanding of child sexual exploitation or child sex trafficking because here's what i've observed here's what i'm concerned about here's what a student has told me um, whatever whatever it may be that you know um, and, and go and go that route. Because if you just have your basic traffic police officer come out and do something they're they're it's, it's no fault of their own, but they've probably had zero training in this. And, um, so, um, you, wherever you're at locally, you need to know the level of engagement that your local law enforcement has, then connect with your hospitals, see what training they have, make sure you know who your counselors are, make sure your faith community is trained on this and your school, your schools, if they don't have any kind of protocol for this, um, within your local work, um, do everything you can to help schools get caught up. Um, and there are materials and information available for schools, um, on that to have to identify what their protocols are beyond just, Hey, we're a mandated reporter. Right. Um, because this is a little more complex. Yeah, actually, I was going to say that, that, you know, any employee of a school is a mandated reporter. So um, very important um, to remind them of that sometimes too, that, yeah. that, you know, this is exploitation of a child minor um, and it must be reported. It's not an option. So yeah, absolutely. Well, thank you so much, Russ. Um, like I said, we will be getting this recording out to everyone um, along with, um, um, you know, the evaluation. And we just thank you so much, Russ, um, for um, doing this for us. It was eye opening. Um, all these comments are flooding in about just how wonderful this was. So thank you so much and happy new year. Well, the honor was all mine. And I'm a big fan of yours, Teresa and um, Jennifer and um, all the work that you folks are doing there. And please um, fight through the compassion fatigue and keep doing this every day because uh, it's getting it's getting it's getting worse, unfortunately. And uh, we need to raise up a standard uh, even higher than we have in the past. Yeah, definitely. I agree. Well, thank you all so much.